Wait, they bombed a warehouse? So, so the Axis are in London? No, they just think they are? Um, what? Okay. November 14th, 1941. It's not usually a good idea for a naval force to attack another naval force that outnumbers and outguns them. But if you can aim at night, and they can't, then you are looking at total victory. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week was a week of big plans in Japan, North Africa, and the German High Command in the USSR, all for making great new offensives. There is a fair amount of action at sea this week. On the 9th is the Battle of the Duisburg Convoy. Royal Navy ships from Force K sink seven merchant ships and an Italian destroyer. The attackers are light cruisers Penelope and Aurora, and destroyers Lively and Lance. Those seven merchant ships sunk are actually all the merchant ships that are in the convoy. They are protected by two Italian heavy cruisers and ten destroyers. So the attackers are outnumbered and outgunned. This is a big failure for the Italians. The British are aiming using radar since the attack takes place at night. And the Italians have no answer for this. They don't have any low light range finders. But they also don't order the convoy ships to just scatter to allow some of them to hopefully escape. But the convoy thinks they're being attacked by air, which is a more common danger, and such evasive action isn't so useful in that case. The next day, German commander in North Africa, Irvin Rommel, tells Berlin that convoys to Libya have been suspended, and he's received only 8,093 of 60,000 troops supposed to arrive in Benghazi. This convoy was bringing fuel for Rommel and a lot of motorized transport, but their cargo, the date of departure, and their route were known in advance to the British who have cracked the Italian naval codes. Also in the Mediterranean, on the 12th, 34 hurricanes are flown from Ark Royal and Argus to Malta. This is the end of Ark Royal's career, as it turns out. It is torpedoed by U-81 the following day and sinks the 14th. There is still, of course, plenty of fighting on land this week. Georgi Zhukov has ordered the Soviet 49th and 50th armies to attack Heinz Guderian's advancing panzer spearheads near Tula. That fighting begins south of Tula the 8th near Uslovaya, together with some 3rd Army units attacking from the south. Now, these attacks are unsuccessful in defeating the enemy, but they do delay Guderian yet again, and this is starting to make him really concerned, delay after delay. On the 11th, the fighting begins north of Tula, and over the rest of the week, and the first two days of next week, the Soviets stop the Germans short of reaching the Moscow-Tula road, which messes up the German attempt to surround the region. Now, on the 13th, German Army Chief of Staff Franz Halder, his staff officers, and the three Army Group Chiefs of Staff meet at Orsha to discuss future options. Remember last week on the 7th, when Halder laid out his grandiose plans? Yeah? Well, this meeting convinces him the opposite, that the army is too weak to do more than just surround Moscow and Leningrad in 1941. However, Adolf Hitler personally orders Army Group Center to take Moscow. He wants the renewed offensive timed with the real beginning of winter to give hard, frozen ground for the mobile units to cross instead of getting stuck in the mud. But this winter is another one of those coldest winters of the century that you hear about in every single winter battle ever fought. And already the 12th and 13th, it's minus 15 and minus 20 degrees Celsius. Still, the offensive, the plans of which I went over two weeks ago, is supposed to start early next week. Stalin and other Stavka members face the grim possibility that once the first hard frost restored mobility, the invaders would be able to capture or at least encircle Leningrad, Moscow, Stalingrad, and Rostov. Even if the Soviet regime could survive such a blow politically, the loss of manpower, transportation hubs, and manufacturing capacity might well prove fatal militarily. This was especially true at a time when the evacuated factories were still being assembled in the Urals. Therefore, Stalin chose to concentrate his main efforts on the Moscow defense. Stavka expects the enemy attacks to come from Volokolamsk and Serpukov. So the 5th, 16th, 33rd, 
43rd, 49th, and 50th armies from Zhukov's Western Front are deployed from the north of Volokolamsk to the south of Tula. North of them on their right flank, the 22nd, 29th, 30th, and 31st armies of Konev's Kalinin Front hold the line. To the south of the Western Front, Semyon Timoshenko's Southwestern Front 3rd and 13th armies will prevent an attack on Moscow from that direction. A bunch of reserve units have been sent to bolster the Western Front from everywhere, from Siberia, the Far East, Central Asia, you name it. And Stavka has ordered the formation of nine reserve armies with 59 rifle divisions, 13 cavalry divisions, 75 rifle brigades, and 20 tank brigades. Today on the 14th, as the week ends, Zhukov is ordered by Joseph Stalin to launch a bunch of preemptive spoiler attacks on the enemy to mess up their offensive preparations. Zhukov is reluctant to do so. He thinks it's too late in the day for them to work, but they will go off beginning today anyhow. We will see how that works out next week. As for the Southern Theater of Battle, on the 9th, Timoshenko gives a proposal to Stavka for attacks on the Germans near Rostov. Both Stalin and Army Chief of Staff Boris Shaposhnikov do approve in general, but do not approve of moving troops around to beef up the Southern Front. So Timoshenko makes a plan that reorganizes the Southwestern Front. His main assault force on Ewald von Kleist's rear will be the 37th Army with support from the 18th and 9th. The attack is scheduled for the 17th. Up in the north, the Germans finally take Tikvin on the 8th. Taking this area cuts Leningrad's last land route to Lake Ladoga, along which supplies to the besieged city have been flowing. But the snows have arrived here, and the temperature drops to minus 40. So the Germans are halted for the moment. The Red Army situation in the north, though, is quite dire. A side note, on the 9th, the Axis have some success in London, as two Norwegian-German agents, Jack and O.K., firebomb a Ministry of Food warehouse. Or is this really an Axis success? Because those two men are known to the British as Mutt and Jeff, and have been working for Britain's double-cross counter-espionage system for the past seven months. Well, Britain is just full of surprises and is hopefully going to launch a big one in North Africa soon. This Allied offensive, Operation Crusader, is set to begin in just a few days. Alan Cunningham's general idea is for the 30th Corps, which has most of the armor, to head northwest from a point between City Omar and Fort Madalena to hopefully defeat the enemy in battle near Tobruk and then raise the siege there. 13th Corps would hold down the enemy at the frontier, then clear the land from Bardia to Tobruk. More specifically, the 30th Corps is to advance to Gabrasale and then see where Rommel's counterattack will fall, towards Tobruk or Bardia. Cunningham is pretty certain the advance will draw out Rommel's army, but his next decisions will be based on Rommel's specific moves. Cunningham will travel with 30th Corps Command to be on hand for quick field decisions. If successful in beating the Axis armor, the Allies will try to take the Ed Duda and Sidi Reseg ridges. And just behind them are the main supply lines for all Axis forces east of Tobruk. The 1st South African Division will be with 30th Corps to protect its southern and western flanks. The 4th Indian Division will cover the gap when the 30th advances, and then once Rommel has committed his forces, the New Zealand division will plow northward from Sidi Omar against his rear at the frontier. Then Rommel's rear forces would have a tough choice, being cut off or withdrawing and being followed by Godwin Austin's whole 13th Corps infantry. There are to be diversionary attacks south of Benghazi to indicate that a big attack will take place there, and the Long Range Desert Group will keep an eye on the road as far as El Aguila and report on enemy movement. There is a slight hitch to all of this, though. Theater Commander Claude Auchinleck has all his cruiser tanks with the 30th to bring maximum firepower to the tank battle he hopes to bring about and win. Both Cunningham and Godwin Austin are worried, though, that Rommel might decide to ignore 30th Corps altogether and instead attack the infantry with his panzers. The infantry only has two-pounder anti-tank guns, which are not super effective. So Godwin Austin has asked for the 4th Armored Brigade. Auchinleck does not agree to this, 
but does make Willoughby Norrie, commanding 30th, responsible for protecting the left of the 13th Corps infantry. Norrie is against this because then he might not be able to concentrate all his armor against the enemy armor, but also because the advance to Gabrasale might not, in fact, draw out the enemy. But if not, then he could go straight to the city or Essig area where the enemy would be forced to fight the Allied armor just to protect their supply routes. Cunningham, though, sticks to his guns. This whole operation is, as you may imagine, a logistical nightmare. Supplying an army marching over 300 kilometers beyond its nearest railhead into the largest desert on Earth that has neither roads nor water. Water supply is going to be a major issue, of course. Since there is none west of the Matru Road and nothing really to transport it on, they've been building a pipeline from Matru. Now, on the 13th, that pipeline is completed to Mishefa. But the daily ration for each man is still just six pints, so it's in pretty short supply. In the air, the RAF has 550 planes to the 342 the Axis have in Cyrenaica. The RAF can also get help from a few dozen on Malta. The Axis do have another 750 planes in the Mediterranean region, but for the moment, those won't be much good. There is a serious Axis shortage of aviation fuel because of British attacks on their shipping. Arthur Conningham commands the Desert Air Force, and beginning the 13th, they're covering the assembly of Cunningham's army. So far, they are successful. And the attack should come as a complete surprise. By the middle of November, therefore, while Rommel was preparing to make his fifth attempt to capture Tobruk, all unknown to him, a numerically stronger British army was about to launch a powerful attack against his positions in Cyrenaica. Rommel fully expected that some attempt would be made to divert his attention from Tobruk, but was so oblivious of the real danger that he went to Rome for a conference only four days before Crusader was due to start. That conference is today, and kickoff is on the 18th, which is next week. And I will now end this week with the British dominant in the Mediterranean and the Germans hoping for dominance of Moscow. I mentioned that Franz Halder seems to be singing a different tune this week. It's because of the seemingly endless Soviet attacks, even though they are mostly unsuccessful for the Soviets. Their overall effect on Halder seems pretty striking, considering the attempt at a big operational victory the Germans are about to launch. Halder writes, Army group orders provide for a long-range and a short-range objective. Attaining even the latter appears doubtful to Fedor von Bock in view of the condition of his troops. He had given them as interim objective the line of the Moskva River through Moscow and the Volga Canal. Von Bock argues that even if we were content to reach the interim objective, we would have to commence the attack immediately, for every day was bringing us closer to the critical date for deep snowfall. We might well be overtaken by winter weather and immobilized for good. The time for spectacular operational feats is past. He ought to know. A lot of you are also subscribers to our Time Ghost History Channel, where we did a year-long series Between Two Wars. Well, if you don't already know, we are now doing Between Two Wars Season 2, which covers the interwar years quarterly. But this season, instead of the heavy focus on wars and politics of Season 1, focuses more on culture, technology, literature, sports, astronomy, more of the personal and cultural aspects of the period. And you can check it out right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Harrison Brown. It is the Time Ghost Army that finances all of our content here in World War II and Time Ghost history. So join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And do not forget to subscribe and ring that little bell. See you next time. Mm -hmm.